Hello, everyone. I want to thank you for joining me for today's edition of Arkansas Alive. And I think you'll be blessed by the message all this week, the good fight of faith. It's time for you to use your faith. The Bible tells us that the only way we can please God is with our faith. So stay tuned as Arkansas Live starts right now. Uh, before we get into this week's message, the good fight of faith, let me kind of bring you uh, an update of where we are in time. I, I like to take all the things that are going on and kind of refresh your memory because you're in the, you know, the scheme of things every day, every day, every day. And sometimes you get beat up, battered, and y your faith gets weak or you, you know, hear uh, contradictory statements or you look at the news too much and all you see is <laughs> the, the good, bad, and the ugly or just the bad and the ugly, the evil. And I, I want to encourage you. I, I want to start. This is a Monday's broadcast, which sometimes I always um, deal with current events or things that are going on. But I want to bring you up to date with the word, with the scriptures. In Mark's gospel, chapter 13, let's begin reading verse 34. The son of man is as a man taking a far journey who left his house and gave authority to his servants, to every man his work and commanded the porter to watch. Now this is symbolic of Jesus leaving in Acts chapter one, delegating authority to his disciples to the church, the body of Christ, uh, to watch, to occupy, um, to take heed to what's going on and to uh, finish his work, which was to preach the gospel to the world. And then he says, watch ye there, for you know not when the master of the house cometh at even or at midnight or the cock crow or in the morning. Uh, lest coming suddenly he finds you sleeping. Now listen to this. And what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. Now this is a, a everyday word to the body of Christ, to Christ's body in the earth. Watch. What are we supposed to be doing? Watching, looking, occupying. We're supposed to be anticipating his return looking for his coming. Now I'm not, he's not talking about the rapture here. He's talking about the second coming of Christ. He's talking about when Jesus returns the day of the Lord and he comes riding on a white horse and the saints of God are with him because we've already been raptured uh, seven years before we've been in heaven seven years. We're enjoying the uh, marriage supper of the lamb the judgment seat of Christ where we receive the rewards for what we've done in the body, but his second coming. This is what the whole uh, world in that time, this is what the disciples were looking for. They were looking for the King of Kings to return uh, to set up this kingdom. And so he said, I want you to look, occupy and watch. I got to leave you now. I'm summarizing here. I got to leave you now, but I'll be back. So you keep looking for them. They, they, at that time, these disciples had never heard anything about the rapture. It wasn't until the apostle Paul that the revelation of the rapture of the church uh, was uh, exposed. Now, let's, let's go over to 1 Thessalonians. And, and I just want to take uh, today to, uh, I guess, bring us to remembrance of the things that are going on in the, in the scriptures because we hear a lot of stuff um, out there and, you know, people get confused. They get um, divided. They get uh, deceived. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and let's look at verse 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 1. But of the times and seasons, brethren... You have no need that I write unto you. And what he was saying, basically, if you paraphrase it, is they wanted to know about his coming. When was it going to be? And he was, he was 
trying to tell them that's, that's not what you need to be focused on right now. You need to be focused on preaching the gospel, the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come. The king has come. That's what you need to be telling everybody. And I say this to you, don't get preoccupied or distracted by all the conspiracy theories, all of the speculation and all the things that are going on today. Paul wrote to the Thessalonians and said, if you, if you think you got a letter from us concerning the return of the Lord, it wasn't from us. Don't pay any attention to it. And he establishes again uh, what he wants them to know. So uh, let's, let's read verses one through nine. Verse two, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. The day of the Lord, his second coming. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, listen to this, I want you to get this. You, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. You are all the children of light and the children of the day. You are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. Today is not the time to be afraid. Today is not the time to wring your hands and be worried and anxious. Today is the day to watch and be sober. Watch for what? His second coming. For they that sleep in the night and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith. Did you get that? We're going to talk about that this week, the good fight of faith, the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. This is what we're about. For God hath not appointed us to wrath. The wrath of God is going to be poured out during the great tribulation period, mainly on the nation of Israel for their rejection of Messiah, uh, their disobedience, etc. God has not appointed us to wrath, the children of light, the body of Christ, the born again believers. You've not been appointed unto wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether he wake, whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also you do. He said, I want you to admonish your brethren, to esteem them uh, in very highly in love for their work's sake and be at peace among yourselves. So the exhortation was to look, to watch, to be expecting, but not fearful of the wrath of God, for you have not been appointed unto wrath. Now, let's go over to 2 Timothy, and uh, just a, a few pages over. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. Now here it describes the times that we are in right now. Uh, notice in Revelation 3.10, we are not appointed unto God's wrath. We will be kept out of every hour of that wrath. That's good to know. That's a, that's a blessing. That's a praise point. What are the things that the Lord forewarned would be taking place? The things beginning to come to pass, Matthew 24, these things must come to pass. All these things are the beginning of sorrows. So he said, we see these things happening right now. He names them in Matthew 24, wars, rumors of wars, plagues, viruses, um, earthquakes, famines, whatever. Uh, we see this happening right now. Exactly what are the things that we are to look for? And this will show us the time that we're in. 
2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 17. This know also that in the last days, perilous times shall come. Perilous means dangerous. We are living in dangerous times. You know, there have been dangerous times in our culture, in our history uh, before, but we're living in more dangerous times. You might have heard the most recent uh, reporting of a shooting. It was on a subway, and, this, and the guy was uh, uh, none provoked, no reason for it, rhyme or whatever. He just pulled out a gun and shot a guy sitting there on the subway. <clears throat> and you'd think, oh, that's terrible. <laughs> well, there have been times in American history where this same thing has taken place. I don't know if you've ever been to Dodge City, Kansas. You know, they made a TV series called Gunsmoke, and it took place in Dodge City, Kansas, the cattle capital of the world. It's still that way. I, I preach in a church every year up there in Dodge, Dodge City, and uh, they're still, uh, I guess, processing a thousand head of cattle every day. Now, they don't drive the herds in there like they used to in the 1800s, but they, you know, put them on uh, railroad cars or trucks, and they're still processing those cattle. But they've rebuilt the town, <clears throat> the old Dodge City, Kansas town, downtown, uh, right on the railroad tracks, where it used to be in the 1800s. And, of course, you know, if you ever watched Gunsmoke, that was probably back in the late 50s, uh, you'll see uh, the marshal's office, the Long Branch Saloon, all these kinds. Well, they have all that. And they also have a little video uh, that the guy that played uh, Newley, uh, he's still living. He's the only one of the cast of Gunsmoke that's still living. And he narrates uh, the history of Dodge City. And I'd never heard this before, but he said Dodge City was known as the murder capital of the world. That was in the 1800s. And he said, because you could walk the streets of Dodge City any time of the day or night and be shot and killed for no reason. <laughs> and I thought, you know, we think that only applies to New York City on the subway, but it, it applied to Dodge City where there were no automobiles, no subway. You, you walked or you rode a horse. He said some cowboy would come out of a saloon and just decide he wanted to shoot somebody and he'd just shoot you dead right there in the street. And, of course, up the street from the old city, Dodge City downtown, that was Boot Hill. And they just carry you up there and bury you. So we've always had dangerous times. Uh, we've had dangerous times because of plagues and viruses. Uh, we've had dangerous times because of crime. Uh, we've had dangerous times because of <laughs> politics. We've had dangerous times because of economics. So, you know, he's telling uh, his disciples here, uh, the Apostle Paul, they're writing to Timothy, and he says, in the last days, prior to the coming of Christ, his second coming, there will be perilous times, dangerous times. We're living in dangerous times today. And men should be lovers of themselves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful and unholy. You know, you hear a lot about the uh, <clears throat> New York City in the news, how the crime rate is just out of control and all kinds of things are happening. But if you remember a few years ago, especially during the pandemic back in 2020, uh, Franklin Graham tried to go in there and hold a crusade. Others have tried to help. And the governor, who's no longer the governor, and the mayor both rejected God or anything to do with God. And in fact, one of them said, we don't need God in New York City. Uh, we're not interested in what you have to say about God. Okay, you take God out of the equation and you, you have no restrainer. You have no anointing. You have no Holy Spirit. You have no power of the gospel, as it mentions in Romans 5, I mean Romans 1. And you see what's happened. The devil comes in. Takes, you take prayer out of school, and you see what happens to the school system. So we've done this to ourselves. This is not God's judgment. This is not God's chastisement. But I want to show you the times that we're living in. Um, 
Verse 3, without natural affection, whoa, without natural affection, transgenderism, homosexuality, that's all without natural affection. That is not natural. That is not normal. Truce breakers, false, accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, denying the power thereof from such turn away. And he says that that's the uh, MO or DNA, if you please, of these perilous times. Now, he goes on and talks about a lot of other things, but I want to go down to verse 14 because here's where he tells Timothy, but you continue in the things which you've learned, being assured of, knowing of whom you've learned them. So let me say this to those of you that are wondering if you're out of step with the culture. Hey, if you're continuing in what you've learned, if you're continuing in faith, if you're continuing in righteousness and holiness, if you're continuing in church attendance, if you're continuing, you're not out of step with the world. Well, you are out of step with the world, but you're not out of step where God is concerned. Uh, you don't need to be condemned or feel guilty or shame or doubt. Tolerance is not a word that you should imbibe. Uh, you say, people say, oh, well, Jesus taught tolerance. No, Jesus did not teach tolerance. Jesus rebuked sin. Jesus condemned sin in the flesh. Jesus preached a, a gospel of faith and love, and he corrected the sin. But what we think is we've got to be tolerant, which means, translated, we've got to accept every doctrine, every belief, every person's lifestyle, every theology. No, that's not what the Bible teaches. He says, you continue in the things you've learned. In the previous verse, he said, evil men seducers will wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. So the culture, as you see it today, on the 5, 6, and 10 o'clock news, national news, that culture is going to continue. I hear ministers say all the time, the world is in a downhill spiral going to hell, and it's your job to stop it. No, it's not your job to stop it because you can't stop it. These things must come to pass, Jesus said. You can't stop the spiraling down the dumbing down, the demonic stronghold on the world. You cannot stop all these things from coming to pass. That's not what Jesus told you to do. He told you to go preach the gospel to the world. He told you to take ownership of your position in Christ and teach it to others. He told you to preach it, to teach it. He told you to publish it. So get, get everything right. If you get everything right, it all fits. If you get things wrong, they don't fit. And that's where confusion and the deception of the enemy comes in. You can't stop. The, the world is on a downward spiral to hell. And that's exactly where it's going, the world system. But God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish with the world with the world system. Uh, if, if you understand your assignment, watching, looking, you're to go and share the good news of Christ. You're to preach the gospel uh, of the kingdom to a lost and dying world. You, you can't change the world, but you can change people. There's, there's a fine line here because what happens if you go try and change the world all the time trying to change the world, interceding, praying, fasting, even running for political office. I'm going to go to Washington and I'm going to change the world. You're going to get frustrated, disappointed, discouraged, and you'll probably quit because you were not told to change the world. You were told to change people. You were told to preach the gospel to the kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom to the world. And the Holy Spirit will take care of, of the gospel, which is the power of God unto salvation. Okay, uh, let's move on. Let's go to 2 Timothy, um, I, I mean, excuse me, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 
I know I'm taking some time, but that's all right. Uh, we have the time. First Thessalonians chapter 5. Of the times and seasons, brother, you have no need that I write unto you, for ye yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night. Now, we read this earlier, but I want to go down to verse 6. Therefore, well, yeah, we already read verse 5. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. Verse 9, for God who has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation uh, by our Lord Jesus Christ. So he, he has not positioned us for wrath. I hear people all the time saying we're in, in the six uh, vials or seals being poured out. We're in the tribulation period now. We're in World War III. No, we're in none of those things. I just read you where the Apostle Paul said where we are time-wise is perilous times. How do we know? Look at the signs. Look at the description. You know, if you're on a journey and you're traveling, you're going to drive from here to Dallas and you're on the interstate and you know you're going west and <laughs> You know the towns that are going to come up. And, you know, if you know you see the sign uh, Texarkana uh, or you see uh, Mount Pleasant, or you get, in, get into Texas, you know you're on the right road because of the signs. Well, you know what road is going on by the signs. He tells you, but he winds up telling Timothy. But you, Timothy, you continue in what you've learned. Don't depart. Don't stop. I remember when I was uh, 12 years old, my grandmother, my mother's mother, took my sister and I uh, to California to the opening of Disneyland. Disneyland opened in 1955. And that's when it first opened in uh, Anaheim, California. And my grandmother wanted to treat my sister and I so we, we went. I was 12. My, my sister was 10. And my grandmother and my aunt, her, her daughter, her older daughter, uh, drove us to California. Well, I tell you what, I was so fascinated all along the way. Now, this was Route 66. There were no freeways. <laughs> and every time you'd go someplace like the Grand Canyon or the Painted Desert, or even in the desert, you would see these signs, big billboards, and it said, up ahead, baby rattlers. And you would think, oh, I want to see those baby rattlers. I want to see. And they were in gas stations. I mean, you pull in to get some gas, and there was just a little building off to the side over there. It was hidden with some kind of uh, curtain or something. It said, baby rattlers, live baby rattlers. And you're thinking, baby rattlesnakes. But when you go over there and look, it's a, it's a kid's playpen with baby rattlers in it. They weren't rattlesnakes. They were baby rattlers. Do you get it? Some of you do. Okay. Everything that you see is not true. It's not real. And the only way you can know the truth and the knowledge of the truth is, is to make you free, is to know the word. Measure everything you hear and see by the word of God. Don't take some news commentator's word for it. Uh, don't take, and sometimes you can't even take the preacher's word for it because his doctrine is all squirrely. And, you know, you wonder, where, where's he been? What, what Bible is he reading? <clears throat> so let me move on in my commentary here. Uh, let's go over to Romans chapter 1. Uh, everything that we're experiencing today and seeing today uh, can be explained uh, from the scriptures. The Bible is very clear uh, about what's going on. Romans chapter 1, and let's begin reading with verse 18. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness who hold of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Now, you know, you're only made righteous one way. The Bible says, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Jesus has been made sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. You, you do not become righteous by attending church. You do not become righteous by keeping the law. 
You do not become righteous by any legal religious ceremonies. You don't become righteous by doing good works. You only become righteous right with God by accepting what Jesus did on the cross, what Jesus did on Calvary and your acceptance of his substitutionary sacrifice is what makes you righteous, right with God. I'm right with God, not because of what I do, not because of who I am, but because I accepted what Jesus did on Calvary. Now notice, uh, he says, uh, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness. He has not appointed us unto wrath because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. God has shown it unto them. Nobody will ever have an excuse uh, because God has shown them his righteousness. The invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Nobody will have a valid excuse Verse 21, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were they thankful, but they were vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Did you get it? Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. You know, I looked that word up the other day, fool. It means one without judgment and prudence. A fool is someone who says there's no God or rejects God or rejects what God has given them. One without judgment and prudence, unable to make wise decisions. We'll pick this up here tomorrow. We'll get into our material, the good fight of faith. I promise, eventually. <laughs> but this helps keep us on the right track. Don't forget to join me every day this week for Arkansas Live. And remember, Jesus is Lord over Arkansas and wherever you're watching in the world too. Send your questions, comments, and testimonies to Happy Caldwell at Post Office Box 26207, Little Rock, Arkansas 72221 or email happycaldwell at vtntv.com. Remember to follow VTN on Facebook at VTN Your Arkansas Christian Connection and follow Happy Caldwell on Twitter at happy underscore Caldwell. VTN is on Roku. Search VTN in the channel store and add us to your lineup. Today's episode is available to watch on demand at vtntv.com and click watch. You can also watch VTN via live stream at vtntv.com.